Good evening, Hatfield. Woohoo! Yes, everyone can hear me, right? Great, great. Here we go. Wonderful guys. It is such a privilege, man. This is nice. I'm stealing ideas, okay? Willow is just going to be out here soon. Trust me. Um, this is great. Uh, well done just to the Atwood team, just everything you guys are doing. I know all of the logistics that goes into this. I just honor you guys for this, especially in the absence of Wes. Um, also one of my best, best friends. It is, it is great to be here, guys. Great to be with you all. So yeah, as Yoni said, we are starting a new series. I wish Jesus didn't say that. Now, if you heard that statement without context, you would think this church is crazy. They're preaching stuff that shouldn't be in the Bible, right? We wish Jesus didn't say that. He shouldn't have said it, but it's actually not what the series is about. What the series is about, guys, is we as people, we tend to have a lot of like preconceptions and, and, and conditions when we approach other people, or when we approach certain aspects in our lives, and especially when we approach Jesus. We have a lot of these preconceived ideas and things, and we, we say often, um, Jesus, if, if you are God, will you do this for me? If you, if, you are Lord, if you are Jesus, like, will you do this? Will you reveal yourself to me in this way? And so we have these, these sort of conditions, and we approach His Word the same way. We say, you know, there's some of it that I, that I like, there's some of it I don't understand, and there's other things that I don't like. Now this series, guys, is aimed, first of all, at, at you encountering Jesus Christ in a way that you have never before. By looking at some of the statements, at some of the statements that He made that we tend to either misunderstand, or that we tend to just say, I'd rather He didn't say that. So turn to the person next to you and say, I wish Jesus didn't say that. <laughs> oh, man. Great. Guys, so today we're looking at that statement, hate your family. What in the world is going on there? Now, before I talk about that, um, Willows, actually, we gathered as a church for the first time this week. That was pretty awesome. We're, we're excited. We, we gathered at 5 o'clock. Yeah, you can give a hand to that. That's Something to celebrate. I mean, you guys have been enjoying the, the blessing of gathering together for so long. We, uh, we gathered in each other's homes, and now we're back. So it's really a great privilege. And the first sermon that I'm preaching is like, okay, Christian, hate your family. Enjoy. <laughs> so this is no small task, guys. So, so let, let me quickly pray over this word, and let's jump, jump into it, all right? Father, I thank you so much for this privilege to serve you with your word. I know that tonight I'm preaching just to you. And just worshiping you through it. But I pray that every heart will be moved. I pray that people will encounter you in a way they have never before. I pray that you will transform us from the inside out. Soften our hearts, Father. Soften hardened hearts that are here to be able to say, Jesus, you are Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Friends, so if you have a Bible or a phone or something you want to make notes with, we're going to be in Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 27. That's where we're going to be. While you're getting that ready, I'm going to give you some context over the scripture. Now, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Okay, this is about, we don't know, we can't be sure, but it's about a month or two months or so before his crucifixion. And he's on his way to Jerusalem. And as Jesus, you, you guys know what's happening in Jerusalem. Actually, I, I just gave it away. He's going to be crucified, okay? He knows that he's going to go to Jerusalem to die for us. And so as he's going and progressing to Jerusalem, his statements are increasing in intensity, but also in intentionality. To give you an idea, we have more content of Jesus' final week on earth than almost all of his life preceding that. That's how intentional and intense his final week was. And we're not even there yet, but we're on our way there. And so Jesus is saying some things that are pretty intentional. Now, uh, a lot of people are following him. They loved following him because they believed he is, the, he is the Messiah, the one who will lead us, Israel, in a military conquest over Rome and set us free militarily, right? But Jesus didn't come to do that. He didn't come... To save a nation from another nation, he came to save the world from sin. And so he's making some statements that are extremely intentional to exclaim this point. Now, with that in mind, let's read from Luke 15, verse 25 to 
27. Now great crowds were accompanied him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and he does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross, come after me, cannot be my disciple. I get the feeling someone was like, see, that's why I don't want to follow Jesus. That's why. Well, this is a pretty hectic scripture. Now, I'll, I'll tell you why this is hectic and why my voice sounded like it was breaking again like a 14-year-old. It's because I got married recently. Tomorrow, I will be married for five months. It's our five-month anniversary, yeah? Oh. <laughs> to the most incredible wife. <laughs> That sounds like Aubrey. <laughs> and so here's the thing, guys. I've been dreaming and praying about marriage, okay, for a long time. Now, I don't, I don't come close to my wife. I found out after we were engaged and we, we now have to plan the wedding that she had enough pins on Pinterest to plan our wedding five times over, okay? So I wasn't, I wasn't so worried about our wedding day, <laughs> but I've been dreaming and praying about getting married for a very long time. There's some things that you as a man feel like, you know, it's just, it's just going to change when I get married. You know, it's just going to be better when I get married. Axel Peter Wees. And so here I am, guys, in this marriage, this incredible marriage, God-honoring marriage. We're building it on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And I read the scripture and Jesus is like, I hate your wife. What? Now, I mean, obviously... He probably didn't mean it like that, right? Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me share with you guys what Jesus actually meant. Jesus is actually making a pretty, uh, what is it, famous Jewish proclamation. Uh, they had an expression where they said that I love something so much more than something else that in comparison it looks like I'm hating this. Jesus is not condoning a hateful expression, guys. That's, what, that's not what this means. That's why there's another scripture that says, uh, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. It was actually just an expression to say, this is how much more favor Jacob had because of his obedience than Esau. Jesus is saying, if you do not love me so much more than anything else in your whole life, that it seems like you're hating all the rest, you cannot be my disciple. In fact, he says, if anyone comes to me, that's, where, that's how he started, right? If anyone comes to me, and what that means is, if you want to come to me to be saved, if you want to come to me for salvation to be saved, and you are not willing to love me more than anything else, anything, so much so that it looks like you're hating this, you cannot be my disciple. Now, I just want to say this, that you cannot be my disciple is not like this spiteful, no, you can't join the club kind of, uh uh-uh. uh. It is, it is like it's not going to be possible for you to be my disciple. You can try, but you're, you're, you're going to face adversity and you're going to face struggles. And you're, it's not going to be just a simple walk in the park. And if you want to come, I can tell you now that the only way you're going to manage here is if you love me more than anything else. I don't think this message is getting any easier, is it? It's not now. I mean, you know what that means now. Uh, well, he, he goes on, if, if that's not enough. He goes on to say, whoever does not bear his own cross, come after me, cannot be my disciple. He's making a crucifixion reference here, guys. He hasn't been crucified yet. Jesus came to earth with the idea he knew he was going to be crucified. He was on his way to be crucified in Jerusalem, and he predicted it three times. He predicted it in the book of Matthew and many other times in the other books. He's on his way to be crucified. So now he makes a crucifixion reference. Do you guys know when people were going to carry their cross? The Romans made those who were going to be executed carry their own crosses to their death. So you carried the cross that you are going to hang on now. The only time you carry a cross is when you're on your way to be killed. Jesus is saying... If you do not come to the end of yourself, if you are not willing to say, I'm on my way to this crucifixion road to die to myself because I love Jesus so much more, you cannot be my disciple, you're not going to manage. 
Okay, this message is definitely not getting any easier. Guys, ultimately this thing comes down to a little concept we at Every Nation like to call Lordship. If you have never heard of that word, Lordship, can you maybe just, just give me a little one of these? Just, I want to expose you, I just want to see. Don't worry, I want to expose you to one. Anyone else? I'm just kidding, all right. So this Lordship, what is Lordship? In this message, guys, Lordship is about, it's the act of valuing Jesus and placing Him above every other aspect in your life. Okay, it's, it's basically four things. Lordship is four things. Number one, it's obedience. It's obeying Jesus in every area of your life, no matter how you feel about it. Number two, it's submitting. It's submitting to Jesus Christ in every area of your life, regardless of what He chooses to do with it. Number three, it's relying. It's relying on Jesus Christ alone for your hope and your meaning in life. Number four, it's believing and expecting that there is no limitation too big for Jesus to overcome or to remove. Lordship is obeying, submitting, relying, and expecting. There is no limitation too big for Him to remove. Now this is what it means to make Jesus Christ your Lord. I just want to make a statement here, guys. I'm not preaching this message on any pretense that I have managed to do this, okay? That would be hypocritical of me, very much so. But here's the thing is, I am committed. I have committed my life to growing in this part. I have committed to say, Jesus, you are my Lord. And in the times when you are not, when I choose you not as my Lord, I am committed to say, why did I do that? Please forgive me. I want you, my Lord. So I am not here, guys, because I have made this my own. But I am here because it's true. I'm preaching a message not from the power of my own life, but by the power of the words of Jesus Christ. But I am committed to see it through in my own life as well. Now, we have a lot of misconceptions about lordship, okay? Believing in Jesus Christ. Here's, and, and we can tie it up to every single one of them. If we tie it up to submit, um, we say, what if I submit and I don't like what Jesus is doing with my life? I don't like that I have to go through relationship disappointments. I don't like that my, my work or my, my university, it's just not working out. I don't like that I have to do a year over again. I don't like that I didn't get admission to a certain uh, thing that I wanted to study, a certain degree. I, I don't like. What if I submit to Jesus and I don't like the outcome? What then? What if I rely on Jesus and people start walking over me and things don't go according to my plan? What if... What if, what if Jesus chooses not to remove the limitation? And the reason why I left the obedience one last is because this is a big one in our society, guys, a very big one. And it is, what if I just don't feel like obeying Jesus? What if I don't feel like it? What if I don't feel like it because there's something I just want more than Jesus? What if I want to get drunk? What if I, what if, what if I just don't? feel like obeying Jesus? What if I don't feel it? Guys, these misconceptions stems from a misunderstanding of what lordship really means and why Jesus demands, demands this kind of submission. Now, what I want to achieve from today's message, guys, is I want to give you the whole picture of lordship, okay? If you've been through the one-to-one, -one, chapter three is a doozy. Lordship is a doozy. And you keep going back to that chapter because you realize that almost every time you sin, it's probably a lordship issue. <laughs> I want to give you guys the full picture of lordship. The whole picture. I'm really just trusting God that through this message, guys, if there's anyone sitting here and you, you, haven't, you don't believe really in Jesus, I pray that you're going to be able to fall down on your knees and say, Jesus save me. If, if you are struggling to submit to Him as, as Lord, I'm trusting that this message is going to give you the full picture so that you can't help yourself but say, Jesus, take everything. Take everything. Elisma shared her testimony in the beginning. She believed Jesus had 90%, but that 10%, if she didn't surrender it, she wouldn't be here. I want to bring you guys to a point where you're going to say, Jesus, 
If there is 120, take 200. But I want to give you everything. Are you guys in for that? You're willing to... Uh, all right. Let's see. Let's see where this goes. Let's see where this goes. You're brave. So here we go. I've got five points in this message. If you want to follow with uh, notes, I made the most beautiful slides just to arrive here and see that they're not going to use it. Sorry, guys. But I'm going to try and be intentional so that you can um, make notes if you like doing that. So why? Why is Lordship so important? Why love Jesus so much more than anything else? Why make Jesus Lord? Why does Jesus demand this kind of obedience, this submission to Him? Why make Jesus Lord? Point number one, because something already is. And if it's not Jesus, what is it? You see, whatever your drive is, in life, whatever you value most, what you love most in your life, I don't care if you believe or a person of faith or not, whatever you care of the most, whatever you value the most, that's the thing that will drive your behavior and your decision making. That's the thing you will be controlled by. If you are controlled by having to feel the emotion of happiness, then that emotion will drive your decisions and you will binge watch if that makes you feel happy and you will uh, get drunk and you will go into substance abuse and you you will step on other people because you value that happiness more but what if you're sitting here and you're like no 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 christian the thing is that nothing controls me <laughs> i'm gonna say great you're being controlled by your obsession to be independent and it's your independence. It's that you need to make every single decision in your own life for yourself that just absolutely controls you. You're not willing to go. That's probably why you can't get married or hold on to a relationship. Because you have to make all the decisions. That's not how it works in a relationship, guys. Trust me, I know. I've been married for five months. <laughs> I have a wealth of experience, okay? Guys, whatever you place highest value in your life, wherever you attach that value, that's the one thing that you're going to trust to save you. It's the one thing that you're going to make your Lord. And so why not make Jesus Lord? So if we're saying Lordship is where Jesus is sort of in control of my life, and I, I don't want anything else but Jesus, why? Why give Jesus control? Brings me to my point number two. Because who Jesus is demands it. Who he is demands it. Uh, there's an awesome book where Elizabeth Elliot writes on exactly this topic. And she's got a very cool um, parable that I'm going to use at the end, which I, which I like. And um, she says this. She says, if you have the president of a country or the king of a country or even a king or a patriarch of this time as your acquaintance, that's not the kind of person you invite to become your personal assistant, right? Not the kind of person where you're like, Meneer, make my toast, broodje. You know, that's, it's not the kind of person where you bry a garlic roll with. It's, you don't make him your assistant. That's not the kind of acquaintance that you invite into that part. If you're acquainted with a king or a president, there's, there's so much respect where you're like, yes, sir. What can I help with? I, I mean, listen, listen to the scripture about Jesus. Now, this is just three verses of hundreds, thousands in the New Testament that you can find there that is so incredible about Jesus. Three verses. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17. It says this, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. You guys know that in all of history, in the whole Old Testament, in the whole of biblical history, Never has there been a point where God said, that is me. He said, I am like a father, but nothing like your fathers on earth. I am good, but not the kind of goodness that you think. I am holy, but not the way that you guys think. And uh, but he was basically resorted to saying to Moses, just tell the people I am. Because there's nothing I can compare myself to on earth. Once, only once was there. Jesus Christ, God said, that is me. That is the fullness of me. The only time in all of history 
that God, the creator, said, look at him. That's what I'm like. Let's continue. That's first seven words of this verse. He is the firstborn of all creation. Verse 16. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Galaxies, star-breathing galaxies hold together by the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Do you really want the person who holds all things together by his very be- being, who breathes out stars, who has all dominion and all authority to do what, what, what you want him to do? How often do we resort in our prayer life to saying, Jesus, please, Jesus, please make sure that, that this day, this day I enjoy my swimming. Jesus, Jesus please, like, thank you. F- like, will you bless this food? Like, I don't know, will you at the molecular level just change this butternut and let everything that is good be absorbed and everything that is not, just not? <laughs> Guys, <laughs> we, we do that. We, we pray those things. We, when was the last time we sat and we just said, Jesus, I'm here. I'm here, use me. What, that guy? Want me to speak to him about you? Sure. Uh, here I go. Done. Oh, yes, yesterday. I, uh, no, I'll, I'll do it as soon as yesterday. Jesus, here I am. Use me. And guys, I don't, I don't want you to feel bad because, I mean, it's, it's often because of just misconceptions of lordship and understanding our relationship with Jesus Christ that, that, we, that leads us to, to sort of this lifestyle where we are consumed by our needs. We're consumed by our, our desires and our emotions and that's just the way that society leads you to, to believe. And if you're not worried about your desires, who will? That's why I'm preaching this message. Guys, can we, tr- can we learn to trust that who Jesus is is just infinitely better than who we are? Point number three, what Jesus did requires lordship. What he did requires it. Um, I want us to look at this scripture, Romans 10, verse 9. This is a nice short uh, short one verse where Paul just says, you know, this is how you can be saved. This is what he says. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why is confessing Jesus Lord necessary for salvation? Why Why not confess him Savior? Why not confess him resurrected? Why not confess him crucified? Why not confess him perfect? Why not confess him um, loving, compassionate, empathetic? You know, why Why not confess him these things? Why specifically the word Lord? Why Lord? I'll tell you why. Thanks for asking. We confess Jesus Lord is crucial for your salvation because here's the thing. Whatever you put your trust in, as your Lord is the thing you are trusting to save you. We are, we are in many aspects broken, friends. You know, maybe you want salvation to be saved from certain emotions that you feel often. Or maybe you want to be saved just from uh, feeling over, over tired and burnt out. And, and just maybe you want to be saved from feeling lonely because you're struggling with friendships or with relationships or dating relationships or Whatever you want to be saved from, you're going to use something to save you from it. And whatever you're using is the thing you're placing your trust in to save you. Here's the thing. You saying something else is my Lord is you rejecting the gift of salvation from Jesus. It's not him withholding it. It's not him saying, I'm not going to save you because you won't say I'm your Lord. No. It's because... Jesus is going to stand there and he's going to say, jump, I'll catch you. Jump, I'm here, I'm saving you, I'm ready. Jump, let go, I'll catch you. And you're saying, nope. When we deny, when we don't make Jesus Lord, we are the ones that says, I reject your salvation. I'll find it somewhere else. I'll go on my my own self-saving project. Me. I'll do that. Guys, 
I've had a lot of conversations with people who struggle with the concept of believing in a God, and <laughs> no one denies, no one, no one can, can, can tell me that they outrightly deny the existence of God because of a lack of evidence. That's not the issue. It's not the real issue. When I probe enough, people will tell me, no, I don't believe in God. I can't believe in God. There's not enough evidence. And I they probe a little, probe a little, then they say, no, no, no. If there was a God, how can he allow this to happen? How can he allow this evil to go on? No, no, no. If there was a God, he wouldn't have allowed this to happen to me. If there was a Lord, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do that. What you're actually saying is, God, if you existed, you'd, you'd be a better God like, like I would be. Like I would be a better God. Here's the issue. I want to be God. I can be a better God than you. C.S. Lewis said, quote from C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite writers, he says, there's only two kinds of people in the end. In the end, when we're standing before God on judgment day, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, no, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. And he goes on to say, if you think that the people are in hell, busy screeching, like trying to get out, saying sorry, then you're naive. That's not, that's, not, that's not what they're busy doing there. If you understand scripture, what they're busy doing there is they're, they're busy saying, at least I'm not up there. Yo, I mean, we can probably change a little bit of the place, cool it down, get some air conditioners or stuff here in hell. That'll be cool. But at least I'm not there. I'd rather be down here. Do what I want to do than be up there. Christ did on the cross to save us, friends. What he did to save us requires you saying, I will no longer embark on the self-salvation project. Because whatever I will choose to use to save me will destroy me. I will say, Jesus, you are my Lord because I place my trust for my salvation in you. In you alone because what you did requires it. For Christ to save you guys, you need to reject. You need to reject everything else. Everything else. I have one thing remaining. Lordship of Jesus Christ. And cool booming speakers in your car. Just kidding. Fourth point, why make Jesus Lord? Guys, because we need it. We need it. It's not like, <laughs> why does Jesus, why would Jesus command us to, to make him Lord? Is it because he needs it? Is it because like his power is directly connected somehow to you saying, I will worship you, right? He's this, this authoritarian, like forceful God, right? No. Jesus commanding us is the same way as you commanding a starving person to eat from the feast that is right in front of their faces, where they will die. That's the same kind of way that Jesus is commanding, because we are dying without it. We are killing ourselves without it. That is why Jesus wants to be Lord, because you need it. You need Jesus. brings me to, to point number five, is that Jesus alone controls without destroying. Why? Why do we destroy when we are in control? And why does Jesus not destroy when he is in control? Here's, here's why. My wife and I recently had a great time. Um, uh, one weekend, you know, we, how it goes, you know, you guys know how it goes at the Liber residence. I mean, we were, I, I walked in the house, and I'm like, wife, we need to connect. You know, I'm going to lead you in a connect group. I'm discipling you. We had to sit down, and I was like, you know, up, what are you thankful for? Back. Uh, did you really apply last week? No, I'm just kidding. Guys, don't try and ever disciple your girlfriend or your wife. It's not how it goes. <laughs> Please don't do that. Okay. So my wife humbly and kindly came to me, and she said, like, can we do the Lordship chapter together? And um, I said, absolutely. And we sat down, and we started talking about the Lordship chapter, and we talked about a lot of things, okay? And, and we reached a point where we said, okay, what is one of the most difficult times for me to submit to Jesus Christ as Lord, to surrender and to obey to Him, uh, obey Him, 
obey to him. Well, English for the win, guys. When is it the most difficult to obey Jesus? And here's what we said. When I don't feel like it. When, when, I am, when I'm faced with a decision, speak the truth or lie. Jesus wants truth. But lie makes me look better. Truth makes me look haha poofy dumb. You can look it up in a dictionary later. I really want to lie. Those moments are some of the most difficult moments. Because there's a complete misconception here about the obedience of Jesus Christ. So what do I do? I lie. I disobey. Because I feel like it. And we said this is one of the most difficult times to obey. Is when I just, I, don't, I just don't want Jesus right now. I just don't want to obey him. And I, and I really, really, really just want something else very badly now. And in that moment, what we do not understand is, yes, speaking truth is going to make you look dumb. But here's the thing. That's the way you need to look right now because you think too much of yourself. It's going to humble you. You're going to repent. You're going to be changed. You're going to start reflecting the image of Jesus Christ because you're transformed by His truth. Because you're facing your failures, becoming stronger when you submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But us sitting there, we're like, what do we need to, to obey? You know, like, no, I, I want to obey Jesus because I love him. Like, good Christian answers, you know. I mean, you know, guys, at the residence. Good Christian answers. I want to I wanna obey him because I love, and I love him, and he, he loves me. And when I obey him, like, like I, I want to obey him. I want to love him, and therefore I obey him. Right? And the Holy Spirit says, really? Okay. Let's go to John chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, this is Jesus speaking, this is the final week. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Is that what you want, Christian? Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to abide in your love and then I will obey you. Once I have that love, obviously I'm not going to be so motivated. I'm just always going to desire to choose you. And out of that desire, I'm going to always choose you. That's how it works, right, guys? Not exactly. Verse 10. If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love. Just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. If you obey me first, you will abide in my love. If you, if you do what I say, if you submit to me as Lord, you will abide in my love. And we said, Jesus, how does obedience and lordship translate to love? How does, how does that connect? Here's how. Whenever you are faced with a decision, okay? If you are not obeying Jesus, you are obeying something else. You're obeying someone else, a different voice. But you're also obeying that person's motivations and that person's character. And if it's not Jesus, it's probably my own. And my motivations are pure, right? Like the reason why I want to lie is like, I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want to. No, guys, you're selfish. (laughs) You're selfish beyond repair, unfortunately. I don't want to make you feel bad. I just want to tell you you are bad. <laughs> yeah. You kick them down. You pick them up. You kick them down and Jesus saves them. I'm just kidding. That's not what I want to do, guys. <laughs> the moment you obey that voice, you see the motive and the character revealed of the person you're obeying. It's the same with Jesus Christ. The moment you obey Jesus Christ, you see the character of Christ and the motive of Christ in commanding what he commanded. And the moment that you realize that every command of Jesus Christ is drenched in his love for you, obedience becomes easier. It does. But that is the motivation of the king we serve, guys. Jesus does not command because he needs. He commands because he is love. He is good. He is worthy and able and capable. Jesus is Christ's motivation to command is his love for you guys. 
There's not a single time that you will not obey that command that you're not going to see the motive of Jesus Christ revealed. And that's why you can abide in that love because it's constantly revealed because you're obeying and you're, when you obey, you see the character, you see the motive, you see Jesus and you abide in his love. I'll make a couple of final statements here. Because I've seen many Christian dabblers in Christianity. They're in Christianity either because they're traditionally so, they've been raised Christians, or because they realize that God can do something for them. God can heal my family, or He can restore, or He can give back, or there's something that God can do, and now I follow God. And they're only Christians as long as the tradition lasts, usually until first year. <laughs> because mom and dad goes to church, and they take him with, and then on first year, you have your own responsibility, and your own car, and you can make your own decisions. You guys know that about 90, 85 to 90 percent of South Africans leave the church at age of 19, first year students, because they've been dabblers. They were on the edge. They're just there because it's tradition. But if you also have been in Christianity because of what God can do for you, because he makes you healthy or because whatever, what if that, if God stops serving you, what if, what if that condition by which you came to Christ stops? Then you also fall back from God. And you know what you say? You say, I tried the Christian thing. It didn't work for me. Really? Probably because Jesus wasn't employed for you, so he, wasn't, he doesn't work for you. He's not employed by you. Guys, Jesus made this statement. Hate your family. Love me more. So much more that it seems like you hate. He made this statement to try and separate the dabblers from the disciples. In the end, it was not the 5,000 who he fed miraculously that changed the world. It was the 12 disciples. And the difference is the dabbler says, thank you, God. My will be done. The disciple says, your will be done. Can you quickly want to turn to your friend and say, I'm glad Jesus said that. <laughs> All right. Guys, I want to I wanna conclude with this. I want to conclude with that very cool Thanksgiving. What a champ. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to conclude with this parable. Lordship. Surrendering to Jesus Christ as your Lord is like a beggar sitting next to the street begging <laughs> with his cup and he's got a lot of silver pieces in his cup and that's his that's his wage that's 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 his bread and butter that's what he's going to use to survive tonight and a king comes riding on his horse and he comes to the beggar and he stops at the beggar and he tells the beggar give me give me give me what you have give me your money and that beggar says the nerve this king, the nerve. But okay, I mean, he's a king, so I, I, don't, I don't have a choice. So he takes out two silver coins and he gives the two silver coins to the king. And the king says, thank you. Puts the silver coins in his pouch, takes out two diamonds, and he drops it in his cup, and he leaves. And that beggar thinks, why did I give him everything? Why didn't I give him everything? Jesus comes along and and he says to you exactly the same. He says, give me what you have. Give me your brokenness. Give me your surrender. Give me your life. Give it all to me. Give, give it. Why don't you give him everything, guys? Why don't we give him everything? I want to take a moment just to do a call. Can I um, ask just someone to play a little bit? Where is it? There it is. Spot the piano, thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. We can just close our eyes. I just, just want to specifically pray into two things. First of all, if you are here tonight and you have never, ever had the opportunity to come to Jesus without any preconception, without any, like, okay, Jesus, I'll follow you if you. And tonight you want to say, Jesus, I will follow you. Regardless of what I'm getting, regardless, I just, 
this is you and I will follow you. Save me. I need you to save me. If you have never had the chance to be saved by Jesus Christ, to proclaim Him Lord and be saved, I want to give you that chance tonight. So if that is you, I'm going to ask you to separate yourself from dabblers and stand up so that we can pray with you. So we can see who you are. Yes, we want to see you so we can pray with you. If you've never had a chance to give your life to Jesus Christ and you want to do that tonight, I'm going to ask you to stand now. Awesome. Come on. Praise God. Tonight, it's going to be rejoicing. Oh, some of the leaders, will you just go to the to the people who are standing, please? Guys, the reason why I'm sending the leaders over to you, don't, don't feel exposed, is because you're not alone. You're not alone. This is this is family. We love you guys. We want to pray for you. We want to pray with you. We want to walk with you in this in this road of following Jesus. It's a tough one. It's a narrow one. Only a few make it. But it's worth it. It's worth it. So here's what we're going to do. We're a family. So can I ask everyone who has given their lives to Christ, will you pray this prayer with them after me? And the reason why, um, just for you guys, the reason why I want you to pray after me is because I know it can be sometimes daunting. It can be um, really just difficult. You don't know what to pray. You don't know what to say. And that's okay. I'm, I'm going to help you. But God's going to look at your heart, not at your words. It's not about what comes out of your mouth. All right. Can I ask the whole family, will you, will you pray with me and with those standing? Let's do this. Say, dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving me enough to give your life for me. Jesus, I am a sinner and I need you to save me. I believe in you. You are Lord. You died and you have risen from the grave. Save me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we can we give those guys a hand that surrender their lives? Guys, we don't give you a hand because you have achieved something. We celebrate. It's the greatest choice you can make with your whole life. And that, there's also a second group of people, and now it's fair game. Everyone is in. Guys, we are going to fail many times in our endeavor to surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord in every area of our lives. We will. We're going to struggle. And that's okay. But what I'm going to ask you is, will you commit to making Jesus Lord every single time? I've been struggling with something uh, specific in my life to make Him Lord over that. And Jesus asked me, are you committed to making me Lord? And I said, yes, Lord, yes. And He said, oh, are you sure? And I said, yes, Lord, yes. He said, all right, tell your wife you're struggling with that. And I said, huh? Yeah, if you're committed, then expose yourself. You don't want to hold on to it, right? You only want to hold on to the things you keep in the dark. So do you want to keep this in the dark or are you committed to my Lordship? So Jesus, I'm committed to you. So I had to tell my wife and I was very humiliated. She's, she's, she's just incredible. Are you guys willing to make a commitment to Lordship tonight? If you feel like you once again want to say, I commit to submitting to Jesus Christ as Lord. This is not a salvation prayer, guys. I don't want you to pray now, save me. You've already done that. You didn't respond to the first one. I'm not going to give you another chance. You missed your chance, okay? Jesus is your Savior. But is He your Lord? Are you willing to commit and say, Jesus, when I don't feel like it, I will still obey. But I'm going to go and I'm going to do introspection as to why I don't feel like it and what is the lie that I'm believing? Why am I trying to do something? Why do I want something else than you? What is the lie? And I'm going to replace it with truth. That's my commitment. If that is the commitment you want to make to make Jesus Lord, will you stand as well? We can pray for you.
awesome. It's incredible. So I can basically tell you anything Jesus says and you will do it, right? <laughs> I just want to know, like, well, where are we now? Yeah. Amen, as long as Jesus said so. Can I ask you to open up your hands like this? I'm going to pray over you guys. Okay, you don't have to pray after me. But, but I want you to continually repeat something in your heart saying, Jesus, you are Lord. That's what I want you to repeat in your heart while I'm praying over you, all right? Let's go. Father, thank you. And every single person who is standing here, it's not just saying, Jesus, you are Lord, because it's a cool and catchy slogan, and we're not saying it tonight just to be saved. I hope not. We're saying it because you're worthy. We're saying it because what you did deserve it. You deserve it. We're saying it because there is no other thing that we can say the same thing about that will lead to being the answer in this world. There's nothing where we can say, you, that is Lord, and that is what saves me, and here we go, th- th- everything is better. No, Jesus, you alone are worthy of my adoration, of my submission. And Father, I know that you, you see your children, you say, I am gentle and kind and loving. And if you would give me everything, your fragile heart, your broken life, everything, everything, give me everything. Give it to me because I love you. Lord, tonight, everyone who has their hands open, we're standing up. We give you everything. We make the commitment and we will keep each other accountable. And we pray, Holy Spirit, will you lead us into truth? Will you keep us accountable to make you Lord, to replace our lives with truths? Because we follow you not blindly, but based on who you are. You are Lord. Jesus is Lord. Lord. Will you say that with me? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. You are worthy of our adoration. We praise you. We give you all of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can take a seat. That's all I've got for you guys, Yoni. Your turn. Thank you, Christian, just for that powerful word and just reminding us that Jesus is Lord. I almost am tempted to make us shout that out, um, but I won't do that. Um, But He is Lord. And I think what really stood out to me is why submit to Jesus? Why submit to His Lordship? Because of who He is. Simply because of that. And the God, the power of God dwells in Jesus. And that's just, it just blew my mind just to think about 